All right, now we will change gears a little bit and we have we assume that you have mapped uh, all your genomic variants from cancer genome <coughs> sequencing to some really interesting genes and you want to map these genes further to networks to understand what they might be doing um, in the context of cancer biology, maybe um, some clinical relevance over there and, uh, and also the fact that mutations tend to be sparse and you can use the idea of um, pathways and networks to group together meaningful variants into, into biological themes. All right, some of the learning objectives of the modules. Mm, genes uh, have many names and they, it can be a complex maze to navigate. Uh, so we need to understand how to uh, use identifiers for genes and how to convert those identifiers. Also, uh, genes have been studied uh, to a greater or lesser extent over the years, and therefore they have many annotations from, uh, from these studies. We, we have ideas of what genes may be doing and uh, in which cellular compartments they may, may be acting. Then we will learn about the gene set enrichment test and how we would use it for our purpose of interpreting genomic data. Uh, then we will learn about multiple testing corrections and why would one use a multiple testing correction. And then finally, uh, we will learn about gene set visualization and a little bit about enrichment map. Okay, so this is a very classical scenario in the, in the era of uh, high throughput biology. You do a cool experiment or maybe a, a sequencing assay and you come out with a, a thousand hits. Now what? You don't really want to analyze these hundreds of thousands of hits one by one. Um, and um, what you usually do is you, you perform some sort of statistical uh, mathematical analysis. You come out with a ranking or clustering of genes and uh, end up with these long lists of genes. And to further better interpret your long list of genes from your experiment, you need to use prior knowledge. So uh, genomic databases, pathways, networks, literature, uh, and you better use this with the different analytical tools because otherwise it's a hassle and in the end you'll maybe find something new about your favorite molecular mechanism or gene, you publish a good paper. Uh, one way of doing this is using um, the PubMed database, so you have a hundred uh, genes of interest, each one of them will have a maybe 10 associated papers, some, of, some genes are famous like P53 will have a hundred thousand papers. And then you just do a little bit of reading one by one and you'll eventually end up in the same spot but maybe you don't have all the time in the world to do that. So this is why you want to use pathway and network analysis tools to do this in a slightly more systematic way um, in a statistically sound way and come up with a faster solution. So pathway enrichment analysis in the way we describe uh, comprises uh, two major components. On the one hand you have genomic activity profiles uh, which is a very broad way of saying anything that you can measure uh, in a high throughput uh, experiment. For example, you could measure all the somatic mutations in a set of tumor samples, or you could measure the gene expression, the profiles of all the genes in the cell. Uh, so you'll get a maybe a list of genes or maybe a ranked list of genes or perhaps genes with scores. And on the other hand, we have abundant knowledge about what genes have been doing or have been observed to be doing in various experiments that have been accumulated over years and years of research in various pathways, uh, pathway databases and uh, network databases and genomic databases. Using these two sets of information, so gene annotations and the gene themselves, uh, you can use various tools that statistically integrate uh, gene information and annotations, and then you come up with, um, say, pathways or networks that are enriched in your, in your genes of interest, or uh, maybe some structural relationships or gene regulatory networks, so on and so forth. So this is a very general description of, uh, of a family of methods that can be applied. But before you go into that analysis, you want to call genes with the right names. This is really important because there are increasing, uh, you know, even meta studies showing how everyone's favorite tool, the Excel spreadsheet, uh, tends to generate uh, wrong names just by opening up text files, which have apparently affects up to 20% of uh, scientific literature in high-impact journals, which is, it's scary, right? Uh, and besides these uh, very obvious things, such as Oct4 being converted to October the 4th, there are other more subtle things. 
because people have studied genes over time, they have tended to call them different names, and these different aliases and names still float around and can con cause confusion in your bioinformatics pipelines. <coughs> also, um, different genomic databases uh, call genes according to their own identifiers, and often there is no clear one-to-one -one mapping between them. And these issues that you want to keep in mind is also that your genomic experiment handles some sort of IDs. Perhaps you did a microarray experiment, microarray probe set comes with their IDs. When you map these probe set IDs <coughs> through the two genes, there is no one-to-one -one mapping in many cases. And uh, you, you want to use automated tools to do that. Um, um, and then moving on to some of those ID challenges, uh, one of them is one-to-many mappings, particular identifier corresponding to multiple genes. The, the, the identifiers uh, that have been assigned over time, <coughs> people who speak about genes sometimes don't talk to people who talk about proteins. So gene identifiers and protein identifiers <coughs> are not overlapping. And then there are ma these major efforts to bring everything together. For example, the, the gene symbols are supposed to be a standardized set of, of genes that are unique. However, even the, the gene symbols from the Human the Genome Nomenclature Committee, they change about 10% over a few years, we just found out. Uh, excellent error introduction I just uh, I mentioned. October 4, or OCT4, the stem cell regulator is a very well-known example, but there are others like SEPT2. Um, and there will be always problems of reaching 100% coverage of all the genes in the genome. So if you really want to achieve that, you should go through these examples one by one and perhaps try different uh, resources, gene cards, ensemble, UCSC, to make sure that the gene that you're talking about maps to that to identify multiple sources. Uh, there are automated tools that do ID identifier mapping for you. This is uh, part of G-Profiler. That's part of my PhD back in the days. It's called Gene Convert, and it allows you to convert a set of gene identifiers to various different sources. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's probably a few dozen different types of identifiers that are supported for each species. For human, it's more than 100. Now, uh, let's imagine that you mapped all your gene identifiers and you're happy with the gene set. You need to start interpreting them in the context of pathways and networks. Um, and pathways and networks. Uh, are really abstractions of, uh, of cellular systems and biology. So here on this slide, on the one hand, you'll see like a, a pretty three-dimensional picture of the cell. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see uh, the database description of that cell as far as we know using our current knowledge. So various components of the cell, various processes of the cell, um, and molecular functions ultimately boil down to lists of genes. This is the, the simplest type of a pathway or a functional characterization of gene uh, of biology, just lists of genes associated to some sort of function, uh, tagged with a particular um, term or a, or a description or a, or a sentence. Obviously, this is much more complicated because genes interact with one another, they activate or inhibit one another or make physical complexes, but in the the most simplest form, in the, when we talk about functional annotations, we just talk about gene sets and gene lists. Are different genes in different lists? Like, is one gene going to be in different lists? Absolutely. That is one of the major problems, uh, is uh, the, the redundancy of various pathway lists. But these aren't pathways. Like, gene sets are different from gene pathways. Um, Yes, it depends on how, how you analyze them. The easiest way to do pathway enrichment analysis is to treat the pathway as a set of genes without interactions. That is like the biology, right? It's not. It's the very simplest abstraction of biology, yeah. Yeah. right? You add a layer of uh, interactions, it becomes much more complex, much more meaningful, uh, but you also reduce coverage. So not every pathway that we know of has very detailed interactions. What I'm saying is that a given gene can be multiple pathways. Absolutely, yes. More coming on that on the next slides. So what are pathways? I think everyone who works in biology or even in pathways will have a different, uh, different interpretation to what is a pathway. 
uh, in the context of this lecture, the pathway is mostly a set of genes that are working towards the same function in some way, and they, they are ultimately coming from a database where human curators or curating algorithms have accumulated that knowledge over time. Um, one of those databases is called the gene ontology. The gene ontology contains biological process, a particular structure that has thousands of uh, sets of genes that have been associated to various pathways and processes. Uh, other pathway databases include the uh, Reactome, developed here at the OICR, which uh, generally provides uh, more detailed information, also including interactions and uh, uh, post-translational modifications, various details that we need to know how genes interact in order to carry out function. But uh, if, we, if you have a set of genes, then the pathway enrichment analysis starts to look like uh, a hammer with a bunch of nails. So you can use that type of an approach to do many other things. Besides these gene ontology biological processes, you can also look at cell components, uh, hypothesizing that it may, maybe many of your genes that you detected are, are more enriched or present in a particular cellular component. Maybe that has something to do with your experiment. You can look for disease annotations or positions within a chromosome, or perhaps uh, transcription factor binding sites that are all seem to be near your genes of interest. So the statistical framework um, is uh, relevant and applicable to much more than just sets of uh, genes associated to pathways. So what is the gene ontology? This is the major resource that you are likely to use when you do pathway enrichment analysis in the sense of these uh, testing gene sets. And gene ontology generally uh, contains two things. First of all, it's a very complex uh, and detailed <coughs> dictionary of, uh, of biological phenomena. It, it's a set of words and uh, concepts and phrases uh, from biology, and they are connected into this hierarchical structure. On the top of the hierarchical structure, you may have some, something like the biological process, which is further distinguished into cellular processes and uh, extracellular processes and so on, all the way to the very bottom most levels of very detailed uh, processes and functions that maybe are associated to only one gene. So point one, the gene ontology is a dictionary. Uh, and uh, the second part is that it's a set of annotations. So for many genes that we know of, we have little arrows that connect to these particular words in the dictionary. Or in other words, we have found that that gene is associated to a particular process in the gene ontology. And gene ontology is general. So it applies to the biology of prokaryotes and eukaryotes and humans and mammals and fish and everyone, uh, and everyone alive should so essentially be able to be mapped to the gene ontology. Oh, here's actually an example of the structure that I described earlier. Uh, this is a uh, directed acyclic graph or a, an, an ontology where the terms uh, are more general towards the top and uh, more specific towards the bottom. They are connected through various logic, uh, logical relationships. A biological process can be part of another biological process or it can be a more general or specific uh, manifestation of it. And these uh, different terms describe uh, multiple levels of detail of gene function. And as we already started to discuss, uh, genes will be annotated to various levels of organization here. And therefore, there is an immense level of uh, redundancy. So one particular gene can be associated to hundreds or thousands of gene, gene ontology terms, because these terms are interrelated to each other through hierarchy. What does Go cover? Gene ontology has three different branches. So it looks like a, a, a tree upside down. And those the major th three branches represent cellular component, molecular function, and biological process. Whereas biological <coughs> process is us usually the most informative when you do pathway enrichment analysis. Um, this is because this covers all the cancer-related uh, processes, such as uh, cell cycle, proliferation, differentiation. Uh, the, the molecular function tree is more towards uh, biochemistry and cell components are what they are. So it's, it's more difficult to interpret them directly in the context of cancer. OK, so as I discussed, there are the terms that make up the gene ontology and the annotations. Where do the terms come from? The ger terms generally come from two major sources. Um, uh, literature curation is carried out by experts uh, in the field. Uh, the gene ontology. Um, 
editors at the EBI in Cambridge, and also species-specific databases maintain their own gene ontology annotations, but they ultimately converge into a gene ontology database that is updated very frequently. I think it's updated every day. Uh, terms are generally added by request and expert help with major development because this is a this is a live uh, organism so to say it changes every once in a while and uh, sometimes there are major changes like bigger branches being erased or or created um, and here are some numbers it's evolving actually pretty rapidly and it's worth paying attention to when you use like an online tool to do uh, gene ontology analysis when was it last updated because that may actually uh, change your results quite a bit uh, second part of gene ontology are the annotations, and these are even more dynamic because people discover new gene functions all the time. Uh, genes are linked or associated by, with Go terms by trained curations, or more often uh, algorithms are associating uh, these genes to various processes and pathways. These are known as gene associations or Go annotations, and as we already mentioned, there are multiple annotations per gene. So. Why are there multiple annotations? One of them is that genes work in multiple pathways, obviously. But the other one is a more technical reason, because all of these pathways are hierarchically related, so are their gene contents. So if a particular gene is part of a pathway, it is also part of any parent pathways. So here's an example of uh, the Aurora kinase B. Uh, which is associated to B cell apoptosis, a particular form of apoptosis. But in addition to that specific annotation to B cell apoptosis, it is all automatically also part of any other more general forms of apoptosis and cell death and all the way to the biological process. So you, you can see that uh, by an expert curating Aurora kinase B into one process or pathway, automatically it, it gets replicated to, you know, dozens of other pathways that come above that particular pathway. So that creates a lot of information to uh, crunch through the algorithms or visualize. Um, annotations come in different uh, flavors, and that also determines how, how, what is their quality in terms of uh, scientific knowledge behind it. And the, the most uh, foolproof is manual annotation curated by scientists. Uh, it is generally high quality. Uh, but it's also a, a much smaller number of the total number of annotations. So only, only so many annotations can be uh, curated by experts, especially these days when there are many high throughput experiments, endless supplementary tables of genes associated to who knows what. And then many times it, these are the automated procedures that go through the uh, different supplementary tables and uh, associate the genes to the functions. So this is called electronic Go annotations. They actually make up the majority of annotations. Uh, and in some tools that you use, you have the opportunity uh, to exclude electronic annotations to, and only to stick with the more high confidence annotations when you perform your analysis. So the key point is like once you find your favorite genes or favorite annotations, make sure to go back into the original annotations or at least the, the quality scores of those annotations and see what type of evidence was actually provided in order to make the conclusion that one gene is associated to another process. Um, some evidence types have been formalized, and you can see here that they range all from like a direct mutation experiment to gene conservation to gene expression similarity, all the way to things like author statement or, or unknown uh, or electronic annotation. So that just tells you that certain results you should take with more salt than other results. And, um, and there are certain visualizations, including in the G-Profiler software, that will allow you to have a quick glance of what type of evidence basically supports your findings in, the terms of, in terms of pathways and networks. Um, here's an example. Uh, there are various uh, types of evidence that support the relationship between a gene and the pathway are color-coded. Uh, so the darker red colors represent the high-confidence experiments. And then the lighter and bluer it goes, the more likely the evidence is high throughput, maybe ex uh, curated by an algorithm rather than a person. Um, and uh, that will tell you how confident that finding is in general in context uh, of known, uh, known information. 
I've mentioned this a couple of times now, but it's worth mentioning again. Uh, gene ontology and especially the gene annotations are evolving very rapidly. Uh, so information gets uh, past their best before date quite quickly. Uh, this is a study that we performed in our lab here, where we um, went back into uh, different releases of the gene ontology and essentially counted uh, how many terms there existed in the vocabulary at different years. Uh, and how many gene annotations there existed uh, in different years. In this figure, you'll see that the number of terms or the thickness of the vo vocabulary of biomedical uh, knowledge basically doubled over the past seven years, from 10,000 uh, to 20,000 in uh, mouse and human, and other species showed similar growth. Now, but where it really matters is when people do a analyze their data using public resources because uh, it turned out that many of the online web-based tools that carry out gene ontology analysis hadn't been updated for years. So we, we went out to investigate um, how does that affect the results. So it turns out that there's an elephant in the room uh, denoted by this uh, red big bar. The height of the bar shows the number of citations of that particular software uh, in 2015, so two years ago. It seems that uh, it captured the majority of citations in the pathway analysis space, uh, yet their annotations were more than six years old at that point. Uh, so uh, um, that means that uh, a lot of the knowledge uh, from that tool that went into the scientific literature is, is likely a little bit out of date or at, at worst it's invalid. Uh, and we, we sort of looked into that the more comprehensively by analyzing the list of cancer driver genes from a brain cancer, just to compare what does it mean that uh, one study would have used uh, annotations from five years ago and another study would have used uh, very recent annotations. And then this network visualization uh, uh, shows in purple uh, the information that you, uh, that you get from uh, up-to-date uh, pathway analysis, and the, the yellow shows you the information that you would get from both the updated version and the out-of-date version. So that's about uh, four or four, five times more information that you would get when you use an up-to-date database compared to a popular yet uh, outdated database. Uh, and uh, in terms of cancer biology, this, uh, uh, this pathway analysis revealed you know, some, uh, some pathways that are now in clinical trials for, for cancer drugs that weren't obviously apparent in the earlier days because these, uh, these pathway targets haven't been discovered yet. So whatever you do, when you do a pathway enrichment analysis, it's worth paying attention to when, when the information was last updated. But that tool, data was updated after the paper? No, it was uh, updated after the bioarchive went viral. Oh, okay. So um, it's fair to say that David has been updated, uh, but uh, you could speculate that some of that happened before because people noticed that it's really out of date. Yeah, but it is a big problem because everybody knows that they, they will keep coming back to that. So, mm -hmm. is there any sort of good solution to that? They probably just run out of funding. Or so, how do yeah. So? Well, they they need to update it just consistently. No, but no, it's a big point though that it's, there's very there are very few funding sources for maintenance and updates mm -hmm. of databases. <laughs> okay, so what are pathways? Everyone will have their own idea. Um, pathways are simplifications of uh, molecular biology where we attempt to depict uh, the mechanistic details of various systems, metabolic systems, signaling systems, other systems. Pathways are uh, accurate to the level of detail that we know. Um, they're curated by humans. Uh, we try to capture cause and effect, and the, uh, perhaps the most powerful way is to visualize these different relationships in a human interpretable way. However, pathways are more sparsely covering the genome than functional sets, so it's easy to pile uh, genes into sets saying that someone somewhere found that these genes are all working on the same function. However, to define their relationships or various kinds of molecular interactions, it's way more difficult. And uh, also, like once you have a pathway that's laid out as an interaction diagram, um, 
you need more com complex statistical and mathematical ways of interpreting that data in order to say something about, say, you know, the prevalence of cancer mutations. And uh, pathways could be, you know, static models or they could also be dynamic models. Um, but uh, in order to build dynamic models, we really need good higher resolution data. So here's a, you know, a small example of a signaling pathway from the Keck database. Uh, you'll see that uh, it's immensely complex to understand. And uh, given a set of mutations, uh, you could start to figure out what the mutation upstream is doing to the effect of downstream uh, genes, perhaps. But you really need uh, good molecular data to perhaps measure that. So in the same samples, you'd like to measure maybe protein levels and mutations and RNA levels and all these other things that you often don't have access to. A good resource for these pathway diagrams and detailed molecular interactions is the Reactome database, which also provides several analytical tools to understand uh, uh, the statistical significance of our findings, and these will be discussed uh, tomorrow morning in another lecture. But uh, here we are discussing the most uh, simple types of tests, the gene set enrichment tests, which really uh, describe your pathway as a, as a set of genes. And they also describe, describe your experimental list of the genes. And uh, the goal is to find whether pathway genes are more, like, more present in your experimental results than compared by, to random chance. So I already showed you that figure uh, earlier, where on the one hand we have some activity profiles, perhaps somatic mutation from cancer genomes, uh, and we have prior knowledge about gene sets, uh, genes that are involved in various processes or pathways. And using uh, statistics, we can determine which of those uh, prior knowledge ge related gene sets are actually overrepresented among our molecular information, so activity profiles or somatic mutations, or gene expression uh, values, or so on. So on. So a typical enrichment um, test looks like this. Um, uh, on the left in yellow, you'll see your experimentally derived positive genes. So these may be genes that, for example, had uh, a detectable amount of positive selection in your cancer genomes. They had more than expected number of mutations. And then the bigger box uh, in, uh, in tan and yellow represents all the genes that you analyzed. So perhaps you were looking only at the protein coding segment of the genome. You looked at 20,000 genes. Out of those, 100 sh showed more than expected number of, um, uh, number of mutations. Uh, this defines your background and foreground sets. So these are all the genes that you studied. Now you have a black box called enrichment test, which will, as additional input, take all the, all the gene set databases as input. It will crunch through the different gene sets and decide that uh, some of the gene sets are particularly representative uh, of, the, of your experimental data. So maybe a spindle uh, function and apoptosis were some of them. And they come with a statistical significant p-value. You report the p-value, visualize the results, and uh, publish. And so what does the p-value really do? Um, one of the more common p-values uh, that we compute is a Fisher's exact p-value or a hypergeometric test p-value. Uh, and the p-value assesses the probability that by random sampling of genes, uh, from the detectable set of genes, uh, you'll get an overlap with, uh, uh, with a particular pathway that is as large as, uh, um, as the, uh, the pathway that you observed. Um, uh, to compute the Fisher's exact test, you essentially build a uh, contingency table where you decide whether a gene set uh, uh, whether any gene is present in a gene set, yes or no, or whether any gene is present in your significantly mutated list of genes, yes or no. Um, and you'll you estimate the probability of seeing that by chance using the hypergeometric distribution. Um, and then if the, the gene set is more overrepresented than you would expect by chance, you can report that that, that, that uh, pathway maybe has some sort of a significance uh, in your experiment. Now, a really important thing to pay attention to uh, is the background rate. So uh, the experimentally detected genes is usually set to the entire set of protein coding genes in any pathway tool. And that assumes that you are actually actively able to measure any of the detectable genes in the genome. So 
perhaps this is the case in a in a standard sequencing study where you were actually actively sequencing all the exon, uh, exons of all the genes. However, uh, let's imagine a situation that you're looking at an older data set where only 100 genes were sequenced. So maybe that's uh, part of a, a gene panel of well, very well-established cancer genes. And any patient in that uh, set only was sequenced for that 100. So the rest of the almost 20,000 genes had no signal whatsoever. Uh, if you run your uh, statistical enrichment test, now using the, the entire set of coding genes, you will get very large inflations in any pathways, because any, any gene that you come out with that has a, has a meaningful score will only be sampled from that 100 that comprise the original panel that you sequenced. Another example is that uh, maybe you're doing a, a phosphoproteomic uh, analysis, and you're looking for the, the proteins that get phosphorylated in, under a particular cellular condition. However, it turns out that, uh, that only about two-thirds of the proteins can get ever phosphorylated, and the other proteins are not phosphorylated at all. Therefore, if you do a pathway enrichment analysis that considers all the genes in the genome, then you will naturally get an enrichment for phosphoproteins, because these phosphoproteins are the ones that ever get a signal because of your experimental design. So therefore, when you do a pathway enrichment analysis, Think about this a little. Did, did all the genes in your genome uh, uh, get the signal according to experimental design? And if not, then you need to select a more conservative pathway test where the background gene set is explicitly defined as, your, as the list of genes that were part of your experimental design. Um, so multiple testing corrections. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard of them and maybe actively use them. Uh, they are essential in the er era of genomics because we measure many things at the same time. We conduct hundreds of thousands of uh, statistical tests, and therefore uh, it's very likely that one of those statistical tests will win the p-value lottery just by chance, and you'll get a, a very meaningful result that looks, um, looks meaningful but can be noise. So here's, a, here's a, a visualization of what this Fisher's exact test actually looks like. Uh, say we have a bowl of uh, uh, genes, or balls, and most of them are boring genes. So they're red, and some of them are really interesting genes, say the cancer driver genes that are known, these are black. So if you just take one random draw, then you're quite likely to mostly sample the red balls and none of the black ones. But because in genomics we carry out thousands of tests, for example in the pathway enrichment analysis we, we can easily look at 10,000 gene ontology terms, then we sample and sample and sample, and then ultimately, a few thousand draws later, we, we pull out the bowl, a handful of balls or genes that are all really interesting, all the black ones. Uh, because of that, we need to apply multiple testing correction. So any p-value cannot be taken at face value, because if you conduct a series of them, it's more likely that at least some of the series will look really significant, even though there is no reason to, to see that. So, um, in essence, um, you can expect the random draw to be um, to have an observed uh, enrichment once every one over p-value draws. So, if you have if you draw a, a good number of uh, tests, then one of them will look very significant just by chance. Another way of doing it is uh, not sampling the same ball, but sampling different balls every time. So. One time you sample black versus red genes, other time you sample square versus round genes, other time you sample apoptosis genes versus um, schizophrenia genes. But if you, uh, your experiment comprises a large number of those tests, uh, you need to take more care to interpret the p-values. The simplest p-value correction is the Ponferroni correction. This is very stringent and it's also uh, a little out of date. So mostly for, for teaching purposes. Uh, if you have uh, M tests, uh, and then each one of them provides a p-value, then you need to multiply each p-value by M, so say 100, to get the actual post-correction p-value. So uh, this <coughs> corrects for, this is very stringent, so suddenly your 0 0.001 becomes 0 0.1, and, uh, and you can't report anything. Um, now. The assumptions of that test are also quite stringent. So you apply this uh, correction, and afterwards, you are certain that uh, there, are, there are no false positives. 
And so the corrected p-value is greater or than or equal to the probability that at least one or more of the observed enrichment is due to random draws, so at least one. And you control for the family-wise error rate, which is a stringent uh, correction. So that we already discussed. You may have actually very nice looking and valid results, but if you apply Bonferroni uh, and you, uh, you go through a large number of tests, then you are quite likely to wash out any important signal and just remain with no, no significant results. So therefore, often in genomic studies, we are willing to accept something uh, that is a little weaker. So we accept weaker results. Uh, we accept more false positives among our results, but we uh, actually gain results with that caveat in mind. So this is called false discovery rate, or FTR. I'm sure that everyone has uh, encountered that. FTR is the expected proportion of the observed enrichments are due to random chance. So instead of uh, putting a very focused count of one false positive or more, you say, say 5% of the results could be wrong. So if you have 100 results, maybe five of them will be wrong. Um, and typically, the FTR correction is calculating using the Benjamini Hochberg procedure, which is a uh, state of the art in genomics, but there are many variations of this procedure for various situations. Uh, let's try to walk through an example. Uh, this is maybe a pathway enrichment analysis where the, the nominal p value coming out from a Fisher's exact test uh, gives you the number of random cases that you would uh, count uh, to see that. Uh, to see that observation occur by random chance. And you see that they're ranked by their significance starting from 0 0.001 to all the way to 0.99. So the way the benjamini hochberg uh, correction works is the following. Uh, first, you multiply each p-value by the rank of it in its, uh, in its list. So you'll see that the, there were 53 of them all together, for example. Then the first one is, is multiplied by 53 over 1 and the, the other is 53 over 2, and so on. So they get uh, adjusted. And then this is similar to uh, the way uh, adjustment happens in the Bonferroni. Uh, now, the, the Q value, or the, the final post-correction P value, or FTR value, um, is computed such that the corresponding, oh, let me rephrase this, the corresponding to a nominal P value is the smallest adjusted P value assigning assigned to p-values with the same or higher ranks. So it becomes like a staircase. Um, instead of a flat series of values, the bottommost uh, value has this equal FDR value to the topmost value, and uh, further down, another set of uh, pathways will have uh, similar values all the way to down. And now, based on that correction, you will filter uh, the 5% threshold, seeing that uh, the first four will become significant, and the rest will be corrected. Compare that to the first column, where all of the, the visible uh, pathways uh, had a significant p-value. The corrected p-value is way more conservative. So as you see, uh, when you're really interested in uh, getting out important uh, or significant p-values, but you still run a large number of tests, uh, you can't really get around it. The more tests you run, the more conservative you have to be about each individual p-value. So one, uh, one way to get around this is just to do a little less tests. You may want to uh, look at your set of results that you're testing a little bit more carefully, filter things out that you think are low confidence, and then you'll naturally have fewer tests to go through, and then each p-value will be uh, considered uh, more interesting as a sum. So one way of doing this is to filter in your input data. For example, if you are looking at gene expression data in RNA sequencing, then quite often people filter genes that are expressed at a very low level. So because they're expressed at a very low level, you don't have a very good confidence whether they were expressed or whether it was noise, and you can filter them. In pathway enrichment analysis, uh, you may want to take a hard look at the pathways that you're analyzing. For example, there may be thousands of pathways that are just associated to one gene because they are very specific. And therefore, you may want to ignore all these small number pathways and only focus on the larger ones. Um, that will also dramatically reduce your false discovery uh, corrections. So finally, once you have uh, detected your uh, 
interesting and rich pathways, uh, almost essential is the visualization of that data because, uh, as we discussed earlier, there is a lot of redundancy, mostly because genes are involved in different pathways, but also because pathways are called different names and different uh, levels of specificity. So one way of doing that is uh, to build an enrichment map. Uh, the problem we already discussed, uh, there are many gene sets uh, and there are dif different definitions uh, of pathways. Moreover, when you start to analyze, say, two pathway databases at the same time, gene ontology and reactome, they will overlap by a large extent. So here's an example. Uh, you started by analyzing uh, 100 genes, and you thought that you can boil them down to you know, three pathways, but it turns out that you boil them down to 500 pathways. What do you do? Uh, you can rank them by p-value and you know, take the top 10 pathways, but because they're all redundant, it can turn out that the top 10 pathways represent exactly the same thing that for some reason is quite strongly represented in your data, and the more interesting and non-redundant stuff comes down the road. Um, the way we uh, often visualize these pathway enrichment maps is called uh, uh, enrichment map. Um, and it's developed here at the, at the U of T in the lab of Gary Bader. It's a network visualization, but as opposed to a classical network where genes are nodes and they're connected to other genes through edges, then this, this network is a network of pathways. So each node here represents a particular pathway, and it's connected to another node or another pathway if those two pathways share many genes. So if pathway A and pathway B share many genes, then maybe they are also functionally related or they're doing the same thing in cells. Or maybe they're just uh, two different descriptions of the, the same, same biological phenomenon. One example of, uh, of using uh, pathway analysis together with enrichment maps in a nice way uh, is coming from a paper of ependomoma. Ependomoma is a pediatric and adult uh, nervous system uh, cancer in brain and also uh, the spine. Uh, usually a pathologist, uh, pathology is the primary means of uh, understanding these tumors, which means microscopes and uh, uh, tissue slides and so on. Uh, however, now there are new methylation-based biomarkers developed for classification. And when you analyze these methylation patterns and gene expression patterns, it turns out that the pendomoma is not a single disease, but it's comprised of multiple different subtypes which have dif distinct molecular alterations and uh, clinical features and uh, age characteristics and sex characteristics and so on. Uh, what we did in this analysis was to understand the biological underpinnings of these different subtypes using pathway enrichment analysis and network visualization shown here. And so in addition to highlighting these various pathways uh, as nodes and uh, as networks and clusters of pathways, we also used uh, color annotation so different colors correspond to these cancer subtypes of various kinds. And if a node has multiple colors assigned to them, then that pathway is highly representative of multiple subtypes of a pendomoma. So now we used to have uh, nine lists of genes. Each one of them had hundreds or thousands of uh, genes. And uh, instead, now we have dozens of biological themes that represent these nine lists of genes. So, uh, we're going from uh, individual genes to more biological interpretation using textbook knowledge rather than alphabet soups of uh, gene symbols. Okay, so in the final chapter of this uh, lecture, I'd just like to uh, introduce a little bit of, uh, of the Cytoscape software and about, um, about what, is, what it takes to build a network. A network is ultimately a set of uh, relationships, right? And you can uh, you can build a network from just a very simple uh, two-column table, where the first column is uh, node number one or gene number one, and second column is node number two or gene number two. And the, if they occur in the same pair, then they are, are interacting, and uh, you can op op generally assign a weight to any of these networks. And there are various ways of visualizing a network. You can also visualize the same network using a heat map such as shown on the left. A Cytoscape is a freely available open source and Java-based application. Uh, in this tutorial that, uh, that comes, we will use Cytoscape to build a network of pathways, but you can build a network of almost anything. 
Uh, one recent example is that you can build a network of wine cheese pairings. That was, uh, you know, uh, published by my former uh, mentor Gary Bader just before the Christmas season. So it, it's a very powerful tool, tool of visualizing, uh, uh, visualizing knowledge and interactions. Um, some of the key ideas about network visualization, uh, when you just build a network um, and it's a large network, it will likely look like a hairball, very difficult to interpret. So you, there's a whole battery of different network visualization tools that allow you to lay out the network in a two-dimensional and maybe three-dimensional space, and it becomes much more organized depending on uh, these various network algorithms. Uh, the other thing that Cytoscape is really powerful at is assigning uh, visual attributes to your network. So as we saw earlier, uh, you know, we have uh, pairs of nodes or genes and uh, their opti optional weights. You can immediately start to assign these features to your network. For example, thicker edges mean that there's a stronger interaction between genes. If a node is larger, maybe that gene is somehow more important or more central to the network, so on and so forth. There's, uh, there's probably several dozen of features that you can assign for nodes or edges, and it looks visually really appealing. So here's an example of a network layout before and after. When you just lay, load in your network into Cytoscape, it will look like a, a difficult <coughs> hairball to interpret, but when you lay it out, it starts to show clusters. Maybe all the blue genes are interacting with one another way more often than, than genes of different colors. And then you can start to build hypotheses by just visualizing and uh, looking at the data in various rotations. Uh, visual attribute uh, uh, loading into the network is very easy in Cytoscape. It's quite intuitive and it's very powerful. Uh, the input is, uh, is often just a spreadsheet um, and you can use information in that spreadsheet in various kinds. It can be numeric or it can be uh, uh, just consist of different classes and you can define gradients to, uh, to color your uh, various visual attributes. So that completes the lecture part. Mm -hmm.